Welcome, everybody. I'm glad to see so many people here today. My name is Dr. Keith McCall. I am the Assistant Director of the Office of Graduate Fellowships and Awards, and I am joined today by Dr. Adrian Stevenson, the Director of the Office of Graduate Fellowships and Awards and an Assistant Dean in the Graduate School. Um, Dr. Stevenson will be keeping an eye on the waiting room and the chat. Uh, so at any point today, if you have questions, please go ahead and put them into the chat whenever your question arises. We will answer some of them as we go if we can. But I will also pause during the presentation two or three times uh, specifically for question and answer sessions. So uh, whenever you have a question, though, feel free to go ahead and put it in the chat. So the, uh, the point of today's information session is to provide you an overview of the Paul and Daisy Soros Fellowship uh, for New Americans and get you thinking through um, whether you're eligible for the program and whether you're a good fit for it and then start thinking through what it would take to prepare a high quality competitive application for this award opportunity. So the Paul and Daisy Soros Fellowship Program is perhaps not quite as well known as the NSF GRFP or the Ford uh, Predoctoral or Dissertation Fellowship or some of the other um, nationally competitive big award opportunities you might be aware of. But partly that's because it's a unique program and one that we don't have uh, too much of an institutional culture of. So you may not know at all what the PD Soros is. And so um, let's just start with an overview of that. The Paul and Daisy Soros Fellowship for New Americans is a program specifically aimed at recognizing how immigration has shaped and contributed to the society and culture of the United States of America. And the program does this by supporting immigrants and the children of immigrants in the pursuit of graduate education in the United States. The program was founded in 1998 and it is a prestigious and quite competitive program limited to 30 applicants a year. Uh, so far, since 1998, there have been 715 fellows in the program, and they've included leading figures in public service, academia, and business, uh, including U.S. Surgeon General Vivek Murthy, Olympic gold medalist Mei Chow, and scientist and CEO Tony Pond, among others that you may be uh, familiar with. In addition to providing up to $90,000 of financial support over a two-year period, the fellowship program really aims uh, to create a network of new American fellows through annual conferences and through uh, community building events on a regular basis that include both alumni and current fellows of the program. And in fact, if you watch some of the webinars or read some of the information on the website for the PT Soros program, you'll see that most of the fellows really highlight the community aspects of the fellowship program as being um, sort of the number one benefit and the, uh, the most enduring thing they took away from their experience with this fellowship. So I'm gonna skip this slide for now. You can come back and read it, but I will send you this after the presentation today. You can also read the same information on the Paul and Daisy Soros website, which I'll take you through toward the end of this presentation. Um, so let's talk instead, before we get into discussing eligibility criteria and application components, Let's talk about why this fellowship is worth your time and your attention. So first, as I said, there are very few opportunities like the Paul and Daisy Soros. I know of no other fellowship program aimed specifically at recognizing and supporting new Americans. Uh, moreover, this program is very intentional about highlighting and celebrating the contributions of immigration while focusing on the uniqueness of each applicant's particular relationship to immigration and to the experience of being a new American. Second, this fellowship program is, as I said, it's prestigious and it is nationally competitive. Uh, it attracts applicants from a wide range of both programs, disciplines, and schools. But don't be discouraged if you scroll through the list of previous applicants and see a lot of people from Ivy's and other sort of big name schools like Berkeley or Stanford. Um, while many of the applicants have come from those schools, you will still see plenty who are from peer institutions of FSU, like Ohio State or UNC. But also PD Source is very aware that over time there's sort of become a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy where when they started the program, many of their applicants came from places like Harvard and Yale. And so just proportionately, most of their fellows came from those same programs. And that's kind of created the self-fulfilling prophecy where that continues to be the sort of programs they continue to get the most applicants from. But they're very interested in expanding their pool of applicants and getting more and more applicants and fellows from institutions like Florida State. So third, this fellowship provides a uh, generous financial support, and it has few limits on how you can stack this with other big awards. So 
You can hold the PD Soros at the same time that you might have something like the NSF GRFP or the Ford uh, Predoctoral Fellowship. Um, the $90,000 in financial support over a two-year period provides up to $25,000 of stipend per year, plus up to $10,000 of tuition and fee support uh, each semester. So $45,000 of stipend and tuition support each year over a two-year period. Fourth, this fellowship is, um, uh, is open to almost any type of graduate degree program or discipline. Um, its eligibility guidelines are much more concerned about whether you count as a new American than what your particular area of study is. Um, so you can be a master's or doctoral student in STEM or humanities, fine arts, social sciences, health sciences. Uh, you can be in a professional degree program like a JD or an MD. All of those are eligible for this fellowship. And finally, as I said previously, this program has a sincere focus on community and fellowship in the true sense of the word fellowship, not just meaning a scholarship. Uh, it is looking to support fellows in their careers beyond just the two years of financial support. And it's looking to build a lifelong network of fellows who support each other and stay in touch over the span of their careers. Okay, so let's talk eligibility. And we'll start with the most important aspect, which is whether you count as a new American. So broadly, for P.D. Soros, what they mean by New American is that you are either an immigrant yourself or you are the child of immigrants to the United States. So for any applicant, the basic criteria is that your parents were born outside of the U.S., and that includes U.S. territories, and that they were not eligible for U.S. citizenship at the time of their birth. The other basic criteria is that applicants themselves are in some way demonstrating a commitment to remaining in the United States. So typically international students who are here on a visa to just attend graduate school are not going to be eligible for this award. Uh, they want people who are committed to becoming new Americans, either through um, having been born as a, as a um, native US citizen or already naturalized as a US citizen or in possession of uh, permanent resident status or refugee or asylee status. However, P.D. Soros understands that not all new Americans who fall into the categories of official residents, citizens, or refugee or asylees, uh, yeah, so you don't, you don't have to have the sort of um, official documentation of those status. If you don't, but you were born abroad and attended and graduated both high school and college in the United States, you are eligible for the P.D. Soros. And so this would include DACA recipients. P.D. Soros also understands that many potential applicants may have only been raised by one of their birth parents, in which case to be eligible, the parent who raised you must fit that criteria of having been born outside of the U.S. and not having been eligible for U.S. citizenship. And in that case, you cannot have had uh, contact with your second parent while growing up, but your second parent could be either a U.S. citizen or not a U.S. citizen. The uh, sort of burden there is on the parent who raised you. Um, so I can get to it. I have a uh, poll here that you can use to sort of take a quick tech to see which of these categories you might fall into, which way as a new American you might be eligible for this. Um, and I also, now is a great time to pause and, and any questions that we have um, so far relating to new American status or to anything I've covered so far. Is there any time limit? Uh, I mean, how long time ago I have become a US citizen? Like, for example, I was naturalized in 2019. Is there any time limit? Like it has to be within five years or 10 years or something like that? No, if you are, um, if you are a naturalized citizen, it doesn't matter when you achieve that status, mm -hmm. you are eligible. OK, thank you. You're welcome. Hey Keith, I came in uh, towards when you were speaking about the eligibility part of the of the fellowship. Would this apply also to um, like online graduate students as well that fit the criteria? Maybe for a partial fellowship or you know not the entire thing since it's not as as extensive of a program as others. Uh, well, I will I will address that specifically on the next slide. Um, typically, fully online programs are not eligible. But if it's a program that is currently online because of COVID, it is oh. eligible. Okay. 
Okay, so I am a graduate student um, in a Master of Science degree, but it is completely online. So in that case, I will not be eligible. Well, again, if it's if it's online now because it moved to being online because no, of COVID, okay. it is not. Yeah. Yeah. So they um, they have made exceptions for COVID period, but it basically the accept the exception is based on whether that program used to be in person and has moved online. Uh, but generally, the PD Soros has not supported fully online graduate. Programs. Okay. 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 Thank you very much. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, relating to eligibility, particularly new American status so far? Uh, Dr. McCall, there is a question in the chat uh, from Babita. Uh, she states that she's an international student currently in F2 visa, uh, but her husband has filed a petition for permanent residency. They haven't gotten a status change. So if her status changes, uh, can she apply? Um, if your status- Mine will be discussed a little later, but yes. yes. Uh, if your status changes, Yes, you could apply. Um, and in fact, by the time that you apply, you will not be asked to actually submit any documentation of your status at that point. It's only if you move on to the finalist stage, which would not be until about this time next year, that you would be asked to provide that sort of documentation. But we will discuss the timeline in, in more detail uh, a little bit later. Um, but generally, the application won't open until October, or sorry, it won't be due until October. So it'll be what your, uh, a lot of the status questions are based on what your status is at the time that you submit the application. Okay, thank you for participating in the poll. I am going to end it now. Um, I'm happy to keep answering questions about new American status if there are any, but I know that there have been some uh, questions about some of the other uh, eligibility criteria, which is on the next slide. So I'll go ahead and move on to that. Okay, so some of the other eligibility requirements for the PD Soros uh, relate to academic standing and um, to age. So for academic standing, as I mentioned earlier, the PD Soros Fellowship is open to pretty much all fields of study and degree programs, although it, you need to be uh, pursuing a full-time graduate degree. And it needs to be, as I said earlier, one that is um, either in person currently or has temporarily shifted to being remote. Overall, the fellowship also looks to support early career graduate students. So rising seniors or current seniors, uh, undergraduate seniors are eligible to apply. So if you are a um, undergraduate senior right now, but you'll be graduating this spring or the summer and thinking about applying or going to graduate school this fall, you would be eligible to apply. If you're a current graduate student, you must be within the first year or two of your graduate program by the time the application is due. So if you'll be entering your third year of study, by the time the application is due this fall, you would no longer be currently, you would no longer be eligible. Um, you must be at the beginning of your graduate career, basically. Now there are some, some there's some wiggle room here. So if you're currently a master's student uh, and you're already in the second year, but you're applying to PhD programs, you could still be eligible because if it's, if the PhD program is separate from the master's program, that will restart your eligibility clock for where you are in your graduate program. If you're in the master's portion now, but that it just continues kind of straight on into the PhD program, you would not be eligible because they'll consider that all one combined graduate program. So again, generally they do not support fully online programs, but if your program is fully online now due to COVID, but used to be in person, it is an eligible program under their current COVID uh, allowances. They haven't yet come out with any updates to this for this year. It's possible that this will change. Um, we'll see in the next month when the application opens, whether they have changed their uh, approach to COVID for this, but um, this is how they've done it the last couple of years. I expect it will still be like this this year. The final eligibility requirement is one that probably will stand out a little bit and uh, as another way that this program is fairly different from many of the other big nationally competitive fellowship programs, which is that you must be 30 or under by the time you submit the application. So the PD Soros is looking to support people, again, who are overall early in their careers. Um, and so it's okay if you will have turned 31 by the time you would actually begin the fellowship, but when the application is due this October, 
you need to be 30 or under to, to be eligible for it. Okay, so the application has uh, many of the sort of typical components that you would expect of an application. There is a form application that you will fill out and it's going to ask you about your contact information, your demographic background and your educational history. If you're currently an undergraduate student, you will also be uh, expected to fill out the graduate program for which you seek support. I believe you're, you can fill in up to four. So I know many people are applying to more than four programs, um, in which case you wanna put down the four that you think are either at the top of your list that you most wanna get into or the four that you think are most likely that you'll get into. Uh, if you're a current graduate student, you will skip that section because you have already gotten into a graduate program. The application requires three letters of recommendation. It will accept as many as five, but four is the average number and three really strong recommendations is going to do you more good than just trying to get to five uh, because you think that it would be better to have five. So more isn't necessarily better. Just because you can submit five doesn't mean you have to submit five. It's important though to give yourself plenty of time to think about who would be a good recommender for this fellowship. Ideally, you're gonna want people who can speak to both your academic merit and your accomplishments, but also to your new American story and to, about you as a person. It's very likely that you'll have a mix of recommenders who can address one of those aspects more than the other. Uh, but when you're thinking of your recommenders overall, you should think about a set who can speak to both of those aspects of who you are. So if you click on this, um, this is a link that will take you to a guide on the PD Soros website for thinking about re recommendations and who makes good recommenders. So I'll show it to you on the website in a bit. They also have a guide specifically for your recommenders that your recommenders can read through about what PD Soros is looking for in a recommendation letter. And it also includes some technical information about how to actually submit the letters and such. The application will also require that you write three documents, a resume and two essays. So the resume allows you space to record your academic and professional experiences and accomplishments. Um, PD Soros says that resumes tend to be two pages in length, but they can be as short as a page and they can be as long as they need to be for you to feel like you've communicated what you want to communicate in that resume. So I'll talk about each essay in more depth um, on the next couple slides, but for now I'll just mention that there are two essays, each a thousand words, one that is about your new American experience and one that's a little bit more of a traditional essay about your graduate plans. You'll be asked to submit your transcripts, both your undergraduate transcript and if you're already in graduate school, your graduate transcripts. Um, unofficial is fine, so the ones that you can access through your own student account and download as a PDF, those are perfectly fine for application submission. You just need to make sure that they have your name and school name visible on them. Um, if you are, if you'll be, a, you know, if you'll be a starting your graduate program in the fall, and so you won't actually have grades on your transcript, you will still be asked to submit that as sort of uh, proof of enrollment. So they do ask for test scores, but only if their test scores were required to get into your graduate program. So many programs right now have waived entrance exam requirements. Um, if you did not have to submit test scores to get into your graduate program, you do not have to include them in the PD Soros application. Another thing that stands out in this application is the option of including uh, supplemental materials in the way of what they call optional exhibits. So the, the application will include a portal for you to upload um, things that give you a, a space to provide the selection team with any supplemental materials that you think would help them understand you, your work, or a different side of you than comes through in your essays or your resume. Uh, as they say, exhibits can complete the picture of who you are, and they don't have to be strictly related to your graduate studies. Of course, they can be. You could use them if you've published an article or you have um, you know, a piece of music that you've composed. You can include that in your optional exhibit. But if you also, if you do some sort of artwork, if you're a painter or a photographer or you do something as a hobby, uh, you can include that as well as sort of provide the review committee with a broader picture of who you are. So um, some of the fellows on the website discuss having submitted things like recipes. Um, or pieces of fiction that they have written that have nothing to do with what their actual graduate studies are. You can submit links to things like a YouTube video or a SoundCloud recording. Uh, so there's a lot of flexibility in what these optional exhibits can do. 
But just as they are optional for you to provide, they are optional for the reviewers to engage and to use in their actual review of you as an applicant. Uh, so if you do want to use them, it's important to think about labeling them and organizing them and providing some context for the reviewers about why you've included these things. Okay, so the essays. The first essay is probably the one that will take you the longest. Uh, the, the webinars on the PD Soros website with previous fellows, the Q and A's that they have available. There's a theme that runs through all of them, which is that this essay is relatively difficult to write and takes a long time to think about how you want to approach it. Uh, so this, this essay should focus on your experiences as a new American. Uh, in this essay, you can use it to tell the selection team um, what that means to you and discuss your heritage or a salient experience that relates to you or your family's immigration story. And they ask you to consider stories, memories, mentors, or lessons that can serve as a window into your world. Uh, importantly, though, there's no right way to write this essay. It should be unique to you and to your story as a new American. So PD Soros includes a guide for applicants on writing the essays, which is geared mostly toward information and advice for writing this, this one essay. Uh, and again, this is an active link you can click on. It'll take you directly to that guide, uh, which I highly recommend looking at. So with this essay, it's important to be authentic and um, as they suggest at times, maybe even a little vulnerable, but you don't need to feel like you need to share anything that you're not comfortable sharing. The rule of thumb for that is kind of, uh, if you wouldn't bring it up in a job interview, don't write it in your application essay. You're not being asked to um, share anything compromising or too personal. But that being said, trust that reviewers are genuinely interested in you and your story and that they will read your essay in good faith and with compassion. Essay two is a more traditional topic. It basically asks about your academic and career goals. Now, a big part of what they want to see overall in the application is that your, your plan for graduate study aligns with your long-term career goals. And that is what you are arguing and proving in the course of essay two. So you want to explain why the program, the graduate program that you are either in or have applied to is the right program for you and how it will align with your long-term career goals. PD Soros wants to know that you are that you're intentional about your graduate program and that and your career plans and that your plan of study aligns with what it is you want to do long term. So in this essay, it's important to be um, specific about the particular program of study or your research or area of work. And while you don't necessarily need to lay out a very long term career plan, um, you do need to show that you have thought about why pursuing graduate education is necessary to achieve what you want to achieve in life. Uh, of course, it's okay if this changes later. They know that you know, the, the best laid plans in graduate school don't often or don't always turn out into what you actually do in your career. Um, they're not going to come back and, and hold you to doing what you say you're going to do. They just want to know that you have thought, thought through the alignment between career plans and graduate study. So I'm going to pause again now and ask if there are any questions about the application the essays or any of the other application components. Um, where do we access the online portal to submit the documents? Uh, I'll show you that on the website. It is not yet active for this year. It'll become active in April. That is when the application opens. So it's not currently there for you to actually see at the moment. But I'll show you where it would be and how to get to it. OK, thank you. You're welcome. So review criteria. What is PD Soros actually looking for? Overall, PD Soros is looking for applicants who show promise of making distinctive contributions to American society or culture or to their field of study. They do that in part by looking for applicants who demonstrate creativity, originality, and initiative. Or in other words, they want problem solvers, innovators, self-starters. The reviewers will also look for evidence of a commitment to and capacity for accomplishment. Um, and specifically, they want to look for accomplishment that has required what they call sustained effort because they want to know that their fellows are people who will likely make significant contributions in their careers, they look for past evidence of drive, determination, perseverance, or what they call sustained effort. Since PD Soros also wants applicants who have a commitment to the United States, 
They will review applications for a demonstrated commitment to the values expressed in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Now, importantly, they aren't looking for you to write a treatise on the US founding documents. Uh, instead, most fellows sort of address this criteria indirectly or show it implicitly in the values and in their story that they put into their essays. So P.D. Soros takes a broad approach to this criterion. Um, for instance, when talking about citizenship, they don't necessarily want you to talk about the very abstract or specific functionings of U.S. citizenship. Citizenship might look like being a good community member or being committed to service. Um, discussing the concept of freedom might take on the form of discussing academic freedom or a commitment to disseminating knowledge for the public good. So they have a broad approach to, to how they will look for these commitments in your, in your work and in your essays and in your life. Um, and they don't necessarily expect you to, you know, specifically sort of write an essay about how you uh, try to uphold the constitution in your daily life. So these, these are the, on this slide, these are the primary review criteria. And most of these will relate to what you put into essay one. They have a list of secondary review criteria. And these are more likely to be covered in your essay two. So they want to know about your promise of continued significant contributions um, as, a, you know, as a person with demonstrated originality, creativity, and initiative, as well as evidence of previous sustained effort. How likely are you to use those traits in the future to make significant contributions to your field or to society at large? Uh, basically, they want you to show them how and why you are poised to leave graduate school and become a leader in your field or profession. They will also review your application overall for how relevant your graduate training is to your long-term career goals. So again, sort of the whole point of SA2 is to show them um, how relevant your graduate training is to what you wanna go on to do. Now importantly, PD Soros takes a holistic approach to reviewing applications. So they don't use GPAs and test scores to narrow down the applicant pool. They don't have sort of minimum requirements for either of those things. And since the application is open to people in very different fields, degree programs, uh, the reviewers seek to take differences into account when they're reviewing applications. So they don't tell you exactly how they do this, but they make it very clear that they are committed to creating what they call a level playing field for reviewing people from different backgrounds and in different types of degree programs. It's also worth noting that reviewers for this application are generally educated non-specialists. So your essays should be written with that audience in mind, minimizing jargon or technical discussions that are field specific. Um, Pediasaurus says that on occasion, they will forward applications to specialists for review. They say, for instance, if you're a uh, person in fine arts and you, you've included, um, you know, used your optional exhibits perhaps to include some of your art and you talk about that in your essay, they might try to get an artist to actually come in and review your, your application. Or if you are in a, um, a very specific STEM sub-discipline uh, and you discuss you know, very technical aspects of your research in your essay, they might have a specialist from that field come in and read your essay. But you won't make it to those specialist readers if you can't capture the attention of the first readers who are going to be these educated non-specialists. So it's important to keep that audience in mind. Okay, and so the typical timeline uh, for the PD Soros Fellowship. So again, this year's application hasn't opened yet, but last year's was due on October 28th. It'll be similar this year. Um, they announced their finalists for this year in January of 2022. You go, the finalists go through an interview round that happened in February. And sometime right around now or in the next couple of weeks, they will be releasing the list of selected fellows for the 2022 fellowship. Uh, and on the same day they do that, they will open the application for the 2023 fellowship. As I said, PD Soros fellows say that they typically spent a few months working on the essays, uh, particularly essay one. Now that's, that's not really out of line with any other big nationally competitive fellowships. Uh, they all take a similar amount of work. And we here at OGFO would strongly suggest that you take that seriously and you give yourself plenty of time to gather good recommenders and to be very intentional about the planning stage, particularly for SA1. Um, so with the application being due in late October, I would encourage you to go ahead and start working on this by July. So resources to get you started if you are interested in this. Um, 
Before I do this, because this will take me off of the PowerPoint and we'll go into a couple websites, uh, I'm going to stop now again for to see if there have been any new questions that have come up. Any questions about application components or anything else we've discussed so far? Um, just statistically, um, has anyone from FSU received this award or how many, you said it was national, so how many schools like would we be competing against? Uh, any, I mean, it's very hard to know how many schools you'd be competing against. I think they generally receive um, somewhere between 2,000 and 2,500 applications for 30 fellowships per year. FSU has not had a previous winner, um, but we don't know that we've even had that many previous applicants from FSU, which is part of why we are doing this today is to try to get more people from FSU to apply because PD Soros has said they would very much like applicants from um, places like FSU. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so uh, before I move off the PowerPoint, I'll just point out that both of these again are links you can click on. So there is a uh, Canvas course that OGFA has put together um, and you can click it and go to it straight from here. And the PD Soros website is also full of resources and guides to help you. And I'm gonna take you through both of these things now, but I just wanted to point out that you can click in the PowerPoint for either of those and it'll take you to it. Okay, so the OGFA Canvas site is designed to be a sort of self-guided um, Canvas course that you can use to um, that you can use to sort of guide yourself through the application process. We have um, a common FAQ in there, uh, frequently asked questions. There are guides, prompts to get you started in thinking about the essays and to guide your writing of the essays, uh, to help you work out a timeline for when it might be useful to meet individually with us here at OGPA and to review your application. Um, basically, it just kind of will help you have a little bit more accountability and structure to your application process so that you don't feel like you're just doing this on your own. You can do it in conjunction with us and with our Canvas course. The PD Soros website, as I said, has a lot of very useful information available on it. Um, so this is just the homepage of the website. If you're interested in this fellowship, the first thing I would recommend you do is come down and subscribe to their mailing list. That way you will get alerts. When, when the fellowship opens, you will get an alert that it's opened. When they release their schedule of webinars for this application cycle, you'll get updates about when those are coming up and the ability to register for them and attend them. They will share resources with you. Um, they'll share you know, interviews with current and past fellows. Uh, so subscribe to the mailing list is an easy way just to sort of stay uh, up to date on everything going on with PD Soros. On this main page and on the about page, you can read just sort of overall about the fellowship program, who Paul and Daisy Soros uh, were and what the whole point of this fellowship is and sort of how it came to be. Uh, but the real, the bulk of what you're gonna want to spend time with is all under this apply tab. So again, you can find a you know, broad sort of description of the fellowship here, including a breakdown of the type of financial support and how that works. Um, this portion, again, will be updated when it becomes available. They'll have the dates for this year available right here. And they have sort of an overview session here, um, an hour long that you can watch that will just kind of provide you some of the same information we've covered today, but from the PD Soros uh, program itself. Eligibility tab will take you through a detailed account of eligibility and help you think through, again, what new American status means and uh, whether you fall into being what they consider a new American. There is also a eligibility requirement webinar that you can watch. It's brief, it's about 15 minutes, um, but it answers a number of questions and helps sort of clarify some of the points. They break down the review criteria here. And uh, you can always come back to this and sort of, as you're working on the application, you can keep this fresh in your mind so that you're always writing toward the review criteria when you're working on your application. Information sessions, as they move into opening this application cycle, this will be populated with their schedule of live webinars that you can attend this year. They will also then post them as recordings. Um, but if you attend them live, you can ask questions over chat and you can engage the PD Soros people. 
So you'll see they have a whole list of recorded information sessions from last year's cycle. Again, they have this big overview one and this eligibility one. They also have Q&A with previous applicants that cover a lot of the aspects of sort of how they approach their essays, how they approach recommenders. And then they have a whole series of information sessions for people in specific disciplines. So they break it down by visual arts and architecture, law and policy, business, uh, writers, medicine and biomedical sciences, STEM, performing arts, community college graduates, reapplicants, humanities and social sciences, veterans and active military, and that's it. Um, and I, so those are all pre recorded ones. They will likely be offering the same slate of uh, specific webinars for different disciplines again this year. So here is um, where you will access the online application. Again, it's not actually open yet this year, so you, you can't get to it yet. Um, but this will also tell you about the application components. And this is a place to come back and check because, again, as they open this fellowship, they might fine tune or have changed some things. Um, so this would be the place just to see what documentation, what sort of supplemental documents they might be asking for, and whether anything changes with the essay questions. This guidance for recommenders link is the one I mentioned earlier. This is what you could share with people who are going to write you your letters. So this is uh, not the guide to help you think about who is a good recommender, but this is for you to give to the people that you identify as your good recommenders, and it will help them through the process of providing your recommendation. So it includes the technical information about the actual how they go about submitting it, but it also tells them sort of some of what P.E. Soros is looking for and what is a good letter for this fellowship. So I encourage you to share this with any of your, rec well, with all of your recommenders. Frequently asked questions is exactly what it seems like it would be. It is a lot of the uh, questions that they get a lot in webinars. And so if you think that, if you think you might need to attend a webinar to ask a question, it would be good to first go to this frequently asked questions page and make sure that your question isn't one that everybody's already asked. This timeline will again be updated for the 2023 cycle when that opens. Um, but you can see here how everything worked for last year, which can cue you in to about what the dates will be for this year. As you can see, fellows are announced on the same day the application opens. Applicant resources is very useful. They have uh, Q&A sessions with previous fellows. So you can go through some of these and just they tell you about their experiences, both with the fellowship tenure itself and with the application process. They have some specific guidances on here for um, veterans. There is a podcast with the director if you want to find out more just about the, the from the PD, PD Soros sort of uh, staff side of things. And then they have these guides that I mentioned earlier, this applicant essay writing guide a guide for recommendations and helping you think through who are good recommend recommenders for this one, and a guide to the optional exhibits and sort of what you can use them for, how to make them uh, have the highest impact for your application. And then there's also this, the five R's of preparing a Paul and Daisy Soros fellowship application. Uh, sorry, for the interview. If you make it to the finalist stage and you, you want to uh, sort of get a pep talk for the interview, that's a good place to start. The other thing you can do on the website is scroll through and explore who have who, who the fellows have been over time. Uh, if you click on this right now, it'll just be alphabetical by last name, but you can look specifically for fellowship year. Um, you can look at, uh, you know, to see applicants from particular birth countries, um, from particular institutions. So you can explore a little bit and see, um, but like I said, don't get discouraged if you think that a lot of it, that it looks like a lot of them are from Harvard because PD Source is aware of that and they are looking to change that. So they know that that's what it looks like if you come to this page and scroll through. Don't self-select yourself out of applying for this just because you see that. Dr. McCall, can I add a note regarding the uh, benefit of using this, um, this uh, database that you just showed about uh, past uh, fellowship recipients? Please. 
Um, so the other benefit to this type of database is um, oftentimes fellowship recipients are willing to share their experiences with you uh, related to applying for the fellowship. Um, and then also sometimes their application materials. Um, we do not have email addresses for um, these particular fellowship recipients, but many of them you can find on LinkedIn. Um, so if you happen to connect with a particular experience that's shared uh, by one of the recipients or maybe the birth country um, or something else that's relatable to you and your experiences that connects you to, it may be the professional field of study um, or something that they're doing in the community that engages your interest. Um, you can look up many of these recipients on LinkedIn, shoot them a message, let them know that you are um, planning to apply and would like to connect with them to discuss their experience with the application process and or um, glean information from their insight about the uh, application process. And for many, many, many fellowships and awards, you would be surprised, but the applicant recipients um, are more than willing, uh, many of them, to, to share those experiences and oftentimes their materials. Some of them you may or may not hear back from, right? It really just depends. Uh, that's the same thing um, with uh, faculty that you reach out to for, for many things. But for the most part, uh, many of them will re reply and are more than happy um, to share their experiences. Oftentimes they serve as ambassadors um, for these particular fellowships and awards. And so they are uh, uh, supported from the agency, the funding agency to really share those experiences moving forward as they matriculate through the, the fellowship um, uh, and award process. Yes, uh, certainly that is, that is a good resource to use. And so is the Office of Graduate Fellowships and Awards. So. We are here to help you prepare a high quality competitive application for the Paul and Daisy Soros Fellowship or for any other fellowships that you're interested in applying for. We can meet with you to help you plan your application materials, uh, to discuss good recommenders for this fellowship and to help you plan how you might approach your essays. Uh, we can also, once you've started actually drafting materials, we can meet with you to review your essay drafts and to help you finalize that application before the submission deadline. So are there any questions? Uh, does anybody, is anybody um, ready to go and, and apply to this? Absolutely. Wonderful. So we okay. will also, uh, I will send everybody the PowerPoint after this today, um, but because I will have your email addresses from having been interested in this, I will also, once we know that the fellowship has opened, I will send you all an announcement letting you know that the fellowship has opened and just remind you um, about the resources and um, hopefully get you to start working on an application as early in the process as possible. Dr. McCall, before we close out, if you could go back to the ACFA um, Paul and Daisy Soros Canvas site, I really would like for um, the folks that stuck around to the, uh, the information related to getting started with ACFA as it relates to fellowship advising support uh, for this particular award. So if we could go to the, I believe it's the essays. Yes. Okay. And really just um, quickly go over um, the uh, process of uh, working with the office um, to get started crafting and drafting those application materials, but more importantly, setting up that advising appointment so that we can serve as a second and third set of eyes in providing you with feedback and support. Yes. Yeah, so you'll see as you um, get into our Canvas site that we have the planning and, and it, uh, planning and drafting your first essay. So we provide you with some prompts to sort of think through um, you know, using some relevant experiences from your childhood or from your undergraduate and graduate career um, to get you started coming up with ideas for this essay and to start you on the drafting process. And once you've started drafting it, that's when you should think about coming in and meeting with us. Um, so hopefully you can do some of these sort of initial work yourself. And as you'll see on the PD Soros uh, guide for essays, they encourage you to do things like talk to family members and friends uh, to access some of your um, 
you know, if you have family photo albums or family documents or memorabilia, to sort of immerse yourself in you or your family's um, history and, and your particular sort of immigration story as much as possible to start just generating these ideas that you could use for this essay. So do all these sort of pre-planning things. And then as you start drafting, um, start meeting with us regularly to review those drafts and to start to you know turn, turn your ideas into a workable thousand word essay that will um, you know, make, make your story as impactful as it can be. So we have on, on the Canvas course, you will see the, a particular way to go about scheduling your meeting with us and uploading your essay materials for us to review. Um, there are other ways to contact us, but again, we encourage you if you're going to apply to this to use the Canvas course to sort of structure your approach to this. So this would be the best way to submit your materials and to make appointments with us. And one last thing I wanted to add to that, there is no limit to the number of meetings that we uh, can schedule with you to provide you with support. I'm saying that because if you need to go through seven to eight iterations or drafts of your documents, we will schedule that many meetings with you. Some of them may be just electronic feedback, others can be um, you know, face-to-face -face via Zoom um, or face-to-face -face, uh, physically, um, but we will work with you through as many iterations as needed uh, to get to uh, a competitive place with your application. And the last thing that I wanted to mention is do know that that is not unusual for an applicant to go through seven to nine drafts. Many of our successful applicants go through that many drafts before they feel confident and comfortable with submitting their application material. So once we get started, um, we're, we're with you for this ride and as many meetings as we need to schedule to work with you to get this uh, submitted, we will do that. Yes, which is also part of why we encourage you to get started early so that you make plenty of time for that revision process. Um, not only do you want time for us to give you feedback, but you might want your uh, advisor, your mentor, or colleagues to provide you feedback in different rounds. You might also just want space for yourself to um, write a first draft and walk away from it for a couple weeks before you even come back to it. It can be important sometimes to give yourself that sort of space on a personal essay to, um, you know, it, it's hard to critique it if you've just finished writing it. So build in as much time as you can to be very intentional with each aspect of this application. Uh, anybody can join the Canvas site. It is, um, it's a self-guided thing. You, uh, I don't actually know how you add it. Do you search for it? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, we provided the link to self-enroll back when we sent out a newsletter um, at the, yeah, a couple of months ago. But what we can do, Dr. McCall, is when we send the follow-up email with the PowerPoint attached, we can send the link directly to either the Okta site or this particular Canvas site, and you can self-enroll. But thank you for asking that question because we have a number of fellowship Canvas sites and uh, I wanna be able to provide you with uh, directions on how to self-enroll in those. Yes, uh, and again, I'll just point out real quick that um, on our Canvas site, um, again, the, the timeline is going to relate to the previous one when we know when it opens for this year and we know the dates, we will update it accordingly with that. And if anything has changed for the application, the review process, uh, the submission process, any of the required documentations, we will also update the Canvas site to reflect any of those changes so that our Canvas site will be a complete sort of one stop for um, keeping you on track with everything to do with getting this application ready. Very good question. We do not have an office um, on, uh, in the Panama City campus, but we fostered a relationship with some of your administrators from Panama City, the Panama City campus um, uh, this past semester. We created a uh, one page website with information so that uh, students at the campus could, um, I guess, um, use us as a resource, but we are here uh, We've operated in a virtual space for the last couple of years. So although we are not in Panama City, we can provide you the exact same support that students at the Tallahassee uh, campus get. So um, if you reach out to us, we're going to send you a follow-up email. And if there's something in particular that we can support you with, 
um, just reply to that email and Dr. McCall or I uh, will um, figure out uh, your schedule of availability and set up some time to meet with you. Yes, and we try to be very flexible in the way that we provide feedback. We can do um, electronic feedback on drafts that you know do it through track changes and comments. Uh, we can meet over Zoom. Uh, we can do both. Um, so we, we will work to accommodate your schedule and your needs uh, for support. We still have five minutes left before uh, before this was scheduled to end, and we can certainly go longer if need be. So, you know, if you have any sort of questions relating to anything to do with, with this, please feel free to ask them. Dr. McCall, there is a question in the chat regarding medical graduates and their qualification to apply. Um, and uh, yeah, you are eligible. Uh, professional degrees, including MDs, are eligible. Uh, so, your, your application would look just like everybody else's. Um, and yeah, I would encourage you to, to apply. They are happy to support all different types of graduate programs and fields of study.